right. It is time to begin the extremely late tea time. So I'm finally back from Tryon Creek. Um, yeah, I was, so again, to tell people, I was supposed to do a live stream uh, on this channel. Um, and we, we took a walk at Tryon Creek and uh, the time just got away from us. And frankly, we were already in the middle of a really long trail and we had no idea when the trail would end because we didn't have with us a map of the park. So uh, I knew I wasn't going to make it back in time for a tea time live stream. So I decided um, to do the live stream there. So, so earlier there was a live stream where I was walking through Tryon Creek and, you know, I was talking to everybody in the chat and stuff. So, but I'm here now. So, um, and I already had like the sandwiches made and everything. So I didn't want to like let it go to waste and stuff. So I'm like, well, I still want my tea. So might as well do tea time, you know, let's see. And I have leftovers for dinner, so it's not like I'm in a rush to cook dinner after this. Alrighty, so... Gotta turn this around. Just a quick, quick pre-warming. Alrighty. That's good. Alright, so we got Conrad here. We got Dangerous Brian. How's it going? Uh, let's see. They're talking about Titanic and Carpathia, I see. Yeah, Conrad, I caught my breath. Yeah. <laughs> that was, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't get to do, like, hikes very often. I do do walks, but where I live, the hiking trails, the walking trails that they have are very flat. So there's, like, you know, it's, it's easy. But where we went today, Tryon Creek, there are some flat trails, but then there are some trails that like just go up into the hills. Some pretty steep, muddy trails. We were on some very muddy trails, um, but it was beautiful. Like, you know, I'll deal with that because the, the, I just love nature. It's just really calming and really peaceful, even though your heart's like beating because you're, you know, you're trying to get up the hills and stuff, but uh, it, it's really calming and stuff. So. Yeah, so I hope you guys liked that live stream. That was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, and, um, yep, but I'm here now. So, Martin, how's it going? Yep, I enjoyed the hike very much. Uh, I wonder... We got 15 people watching. Yeah, everyone everyone saw the other live stream, so they're kind of like all, you know, bleh right now. That's okay. I didn't expect many people to watch this one. Uh, but, um... Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it'll pick up a bit later. All right. So these should be pre-warm. Yeah, that's nicely. Oh, that's hot. All right. Dump this whole thing out. Well, what I was going to do is I was going to bring that back up. Go. Yeah, Conrad, I agree. The views you get from hiking are definitely worth it. Oh, you know what? I didn't uh I didn't put on the uh ocean liner slideshow that I usually put on the corner of the screen. I'll get that up and running in just a second. Let's see. Five, three, eight. So, forty-three. All right, hold on just a second. I'm gonna go put the light, the slideshow up. There we go. 
for a second there, I didn't know which one it was. Like, I have all these pre-programmed, like, images and stuff that for various live streams that I do. So sometimes they pop up on screen and stuff. And I have, like, a whole list of things that I need to turn on or turn off. And I was just like, which one? Which one is it? Um... I saw just have those. Oh, okay. All right. So, what was I gonna talk about? Um. Jeez. So, did you guys like my SS Rex video? Because, uh, because I know that was a very, very different kind of thing that I usually put up. So. Conrad says, this smaller engine is silent compared to Mr. Squeaky. Yeah, this one is smaller and it has to work harder to haul the trains, but uh, but it's quieter, so I prefer it more. Mr. Squeaky is okay, but it's yeah, it does get pretty loud at times, so... Um, I'd like to get a third engine. There's like an engine that's a... It's a mogul. It's a 260... And, um, it's very quiet when it runs. The only thing is that they're expensive, and at the moment I just can't justify the cost, you know? Like, I, I can't justify it, so I, I'm, you know, I, I haven't bought it, but, um, but if I did, that would be the one that would be running most of the time, because it would be quiet and it would be powerful, so it would be able to haul the trains and stuff. Um, yeah, Mike's right. If there was no Titanic, there'd be lots of things that uh, that uh, would not be in place today. <sighs> so. Um, but yeah, so the other video, the, the SS Rex, that one was kind of something that I was really excited to put out because of the fact that, like, obviously, like most people, I had only assumed there was only one SS Rex, and that was the Italian Ocean Liner. But when I was doing research for SS Rex to make my top 10 video, that's when I discovered um, the, the, the other SS Rex, the one that was the gambling casino. And I thought, wow, this is an interesting little story. It's not a long story, you know, it's just a short little, like, story about, you know, about the, the time when, you know, they, they were trying to close down the casino and stuff. And I thought that would be really interesting I don't normally like to cover violence like on my channel, so I thought that video was actually a very good thing because it it was a situation that didn't erupt in violence, so um, it was very uh, tame compared to what it could have been considering who Tony Cornero was, but um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Hello, Mr. Zantastico. Arrow Wenser says, I love Titanic, the Titanic model you have. I got one of those 3D printed puzzles from Cubic Fun. Awesome. Yeah, I gotta repair that other Titanic soon. It's just in such a bad state right now. I, I have to fix it. Um, we'll see how that goes. Conrad says, the Rex video was very interesting. I know there was a there was gambling in Catalina, but I didn't know if there was, if there, if that was during Prohibition or not, and alcohol or not. Yeah, so there were several gambling casino ships. I think maybe in total there were five right off the, the Southern California coast. Um, the Monte Carlo was one of them, and that was right off the coast of San Diego. And that one ended up, after they shut it down, it ended up um, drifting on over to the to Coronado Beach, over by Hotel del Coronado, and it's still there to this day. The wreck is still on that beach to this day, and uh, sometimes the surf will wash away the sand, and people will climb up on it. So that was an interesting one. I almost made a video about that one, but maybe sometime in the future I'll. I'll talk about that one. Little Gamer says, what if Queen Mary was a real museum? Well, I mean, she is a real museum, but I mean, 
I think museums all have different definitions. There's no, like, one definition that is, like, museum, you know? Like, um, because museums should be something that's always evolving. It should never be something that's always, always, always just still stale exhibits that don't do anything. It, it, museums, if they work correctly, they should change with the times and with the the tastes of the public so if something is really just outdated like it's just a it becomes a you know a, a boring museum if you will then that's not a good thing now some people will say yeah but you know the whole point of a museum is education and so it doesn't matter if it's boring like they should keep it that way and it's like well no <laughs> You're right about the fact that, you know, uh, a museum is all about education, but if you're boring the heck out of your audience, then how are you planning to educate them if they're so bored? So museums do, like, museums, like other uh, attractions and theme parks, must always change. They must always uh, find new ways to edutain. So, um... Queen Mary is one of those things that I see so much potential. That's why I want to make a video someday about all the ideas I have for Queen Mary because there is so much potential there. Uh, it doesn't have to be a boring museum. It can be like a modern state-of-the-art museum. Uh, but one of the problems I've faced is whenever I try to describe my ideas of the Queen Mary, people misunderstand it. They they picture some kind of like children's playland when I talk about it. And I've tried to figure out like, how am I going to tell people my ideas without them thinking of it as some kind of like, you know, children's playland. Cause that's not at all what I have planned in my, in my head. Um, I would need to create like concept art and stuff, uh, which I can sketch, I can draw, but I can't, sketch and draw that much stuff. Uh, it would just be a lot of work, a lot of time. So. But I see so much potential in the Queen Mary. You know, like, it would be really a shame if they never updated it for the modern, you know, the modern people. People who want to see something that's new and fresh and yet teaches history and teaches about the old stuff. Um, let's see. Mr. Zantastico says, Hello, Alex, it's me again. I have a question for you. If you have an ocean liner, what would you name it? Oh, everyone always asks me that. I, I'm not good at naming stuff. I'm really bad at it. I, If I tried to name an ocean liner, I would hate the name instantly. I'm just not good at naming ocean liners. Um... Let's see. Little Gamer is... Oh, talking to Mike. Okay. Marie says, I just love that Art Deco tea service. Please, where did you buy it? I collected each piece individually. I bought it all off of eBay. So people are always selling uh, these Art Deco tea sets. They're all from the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. I do suggest... There are instructions at the... Um, at the description of this video, of all my tea time videos, in the description is instructions on how to care for um, old-fashioned china. Because what I've noticed is when I buy some of this china, um, some people have cracked it because they didn't realize that it suffers from thermal shock. When you pour boiling water in the teacup or the teapot without preheating it, uh, it will crack with thermal shock. So. There is instructions down beneath every live stream that talks about how to care for um, your your um, old china tea set. So, and these are really rare because they're from the two ocean liners, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth. So, anybody who owns them, I I urge them to please take extra care because uh, you know the, it would be a shame to, to to lose a lot of them. You know, there's there's so little left. Hello, Ocean Liner dude. Hello, Mike. Let's see. Uh, 
Gregory says the Rex was brilliant. Thanks. More videos like that, please. Absolutely. I plan to do it. I even have one that I'm excited to do for Halloween, but I have to wait till Halloween to put it out because it's really more of a Halloween themed one. But it's it's going to be an interesting little little video, short little video, not epic or anything, but just interesting. So I'm excited to put that out. Um, Let's see. Martin says, Alex, do you know the whereabouts of the two smokestacks of the USS Oregon? I'm not much of a warships kind of person, so I actually don't even know what the USS Oregon is. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not a warships person. If anything, I'm an ocean liner person, but even then, I'm still learning a lot about ocean liners. Um... Mike, today I am drinking Earl Grey, my favorite one. Pretty soon I'm going to have to buy some new tins of tea. And I'm I'm going to buy one called Lady Grey, because some people have recommended that one to me. It's like Earl Grey, but it's more citrusy, and I love citrus. So um, I'm going to try that. Um, but I'm also going to buy a lot more Earl Grey and then some breakfast tea. The Irish breakfast tea is good, but I, I prefer prefer the Earl Grey and the English breakfast tea over the Irish breakfast tea. So, um, yeah, that's what I, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And then eventually in the future, I'm going to have to try, um, Scottish bre breakfast tea. Oh, that's so good. All right. Dangerous Brian says, I tried finding your Facebook page, but nothing came up. Or is it because you have it on private? Um, no, it's it's public. Um, that's strange. Hmm. No, yeah, it's public. Uh, but you know, it's funny because it's funny you say that. I've had trouble looking it up on my own. Like when I open like an incognito window and I try to look it up just to see what other people see, I can't find it either. So I actually don't know what's wrong with it. I assumed it was just my computer. Like, I don't know. I thought like, oh, maybe I can't find it because it's my computer. I don't know. But but hearing that, you, that you've had trouble too, uh, I don't know. But you can try looking up my, my actual like Facebook profile, Alex Adner, and I should have um, the Alex the Historian page linked to that as well. So we'll see. Ocean Liner Dude says, I wonder why there is less bulkheads in modern ships than old ships. Is it because of the modern technology? I mean, yeah, when it comes down to it, technology plays a huge part. They have a lot of safety features, um, and so it, it probably dictates less you know, construction of bulkheads. But at the same time, I don't want to say too much because I don't know. Conrad, no, you don't want to microwave... Um, you don't want to microwave actual china because what happens is it will also result in thermal shock um, because either the water gets boiling and then it cracks the cooler um, china or even the china itself could have ingredients in it that start to heat up rapidly and can create cracks so old the old stuff the old pottery the old um, uh, China and stuff like that, like, you, you never want to microwave it or put it in a dishwasher. Thank you, S. Karthik. Um, Little Gamer says, if you took the time to write a fictional ocean liner and made the art, it could be a epic video. Oh. Um, it, it could, but because my channel focuses so much on history, I, I feel like people would feel really, like, clickbaited 
if I invented an ocean liner to talk about, you know? After that hike, I was really hungry. Really, really hungry. And my sister brought her, her dog, her puppy. My sweet little puppy. Like, best dog in the world. And, um... But she gets so excited when she sees me. And she'll try to jump up on me. And when she does, she scratches up my arms and stuff. So I have all these big red scratches all over my arms. So we're still trying to teach her not to jump on people when she meets them, but she, she just does. And frankly, I'm not a dog trainer. I can't train the dog myself. I don't even live with the dog anymore, so I can't train it. And my sister is really busy, so it's been hard to train her not to do that. But but it was good to see the puppy today. And we, you know, she was with us on the whole hike and everything, so it was really nice. She seemed really happy. Let's see. As Karthik says, I missed your live stream these two weeks. I just finished my 12th grade exams done with high school life and up to college. Oh, wow. Um, do you think that you did well on your exams? Yeah, my friend Eric just, uh, just graduated college. He has a master's in like um, art and, and animation and something like that. And I, I'm really proud of him for that. Um, Conrad says, I can't combine old China with new technology microwave just as well. Slow pace of heating and steeping is the whole purpose. Exactly. That's the whole purpose with, with the old fashioned China is just to slow down and enjoy, you know, the process. Ocean Liner Dude says, when it comes to history, I'm a literal history geek nerd because it's my favorite subject than other ones. You know, mine too. Um, it's funny because when I was a kid, uh, the only history I knew was a, a thing, if you will, was world history. Whenever someone says history, you think world history. So, and I never th thought world history was that inter entertaining to me. I mean, I know it's not supposed to be entertaining, but what am I trying to say? I was just never that interested in world history. But I was always, like, whenever I went somewhere, I was always like, I wonder what this was in the past. I wonder what was here. I would see, like, an old structure next to a new structure, and i go, I wonder if, you know, if, if these were built at the same time, and or, you know, or by the same people at just different times, or... I always wondered about, like, the history of smaller things, smaller subjects that nobody really previously thought about. So I've always kind of been like that. And then, you know, um, now what I want to do with my channel is I want to research more um, on other places uh, and tell that story on my channel. I, I, I like covering some of the bigger subjects like Queen Mary and Stuff like that. Stuff that people really know about. But once in a while, I like delivering a, a video that most people probably have never heard of. And the SS Rex video was one of that. The Benson Hotel video was one of that. Um, and I'll have a lot more uh, in the future. The, the cable cars, that's a story that not many people tell. So, you know, and then the, 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 the Lost Harbor of San Francisco. I think another video in the future that I really want to get... Uh, finished is a video about the history of Golden Gate Park um, in San Francisco. It's got a very interesting um, origin, its history and where it came from and how it was designed and stuff. So that'll be interesting. And a lot of the history I like tends to have something to do with engineering, whether it's architectural engineering or mechanical engineering of some kind. It's usually some kind of history related to that. So I know exactly what you mean. Like, Ships and everything, trains, yeah, really, uh, really interesting to me. Um, I 
As Karthik says, I did awesome, especially maths. Awesome. That's good to hear. Mark says, hey, Alex, great stream earlier. Back in the Queen's room now. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was worried when we were out on the trail. I was like, am I going to have time to get home and do this live stream? Um, but we were still in the middle of a trail and there was no end in sight. And so I realized I'm going to have to do this live stream here in the park. Because I knew people were setting aside time to actually, like, do the live stream. Because some people, they just drop in. But some folks, uh, they really look forward to these live streams. So they set aside time out of their day to actually watch the live stream. So, so I knew I had to deliver something at 4. Um, so I was like, well, I'm at this really beautiful park. I might as well live stream now and do that. And then when I get home, since I have some of the snacks already ready, I'll just you know, start up a tea time and do that, you know. Hey, Sequad, how's it going? Uh... Oh, that's a good idea, Conrad. We'll, we'll practice some of that. She's learning some really great tricks, too. I think recently she learned paw, so she can paw on either side. And that really helps too because her the pads on her feet they're getting a bit worn and so my sister's gonna buy some like dog shoes and then she's been putting like ointment on the bottom of the dog's feet so um so she needed to teach the dog paw so she can put the ointment on the bottom of her her pads you know emma says i'm a little late to the stream that's okay i'm very late to the stream <laughs> so uh, Mike says, I love the history of ships and the old days. Yeah, me too. I like learning about the Edwardian era and stuff. Like, I don't think I could live in the Victorian or Edwardian era. I think that things would be just too different for me to be able to have a happy life. But, uh, I do often think about those times and, you know, like, it kind of, like, invent in my brain... If times were different back then, if, 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 you know, if things were more like they are today in certain ways, but still retained their Victorian and Edwardian flavor, then, yeah, I would love to live back then, you know? That'd be kind of cool. But, I mean, you had to worry about even everything you ate, you know, the bread you had probably contained plaster in it, you know. Um, there might have been lead or arsenic in some of your food, you know. So, it's things like that. Or, like, if you had beautiful green wallpaper um, in your in your house, it could be laced with, uh, with what is it, um, uranium, I think it is? No. Is it? There's some kind of radioactive pigment that was in wallpapers, green wall, green and red wallpapers back then, and it was radioactive, and it was giving people cancer just from having it on their wallpaper. Um, so there's things like that, and that's the kind of thing I wish, you know. And then, of course, uh, they had electricity back then, but it often caused fires in the house because it just was wired very... It's just not, not very innovative for the time, but... Yeah, so if I didn't have to worry about stuff like that, you know, that'd probably be part of it. Uh, Mr. Zantastico, Cunard actually went to king george the fifth they went to king george the fifth um but that story that you're you're talking about is not a confirmed story cunard has never said that that was a real story and there was a cunard historian recently that retired and even he said in an interview it's not a true story that they always plan to name 534 queen mary so um so I, I try not to spread that story because it, 
according to Cunard, it's just not true. Um, it was just something that the newspapers put in the headlines because they needed something to really spark people's attention and, and buy the paper, you know? Um, so, yeah. Sorry, Brock, I, I don't have a picture of the Queen Mary's rudder as it exists today. It's underwater, and nobody has pictures of that. Like, any any part of the ship that is touching salt water, you can pretty much guarantee no one has a picture of it. Like, I can't find any. I've never... I don't know anybody who has any. Hmm. Hmm. As Karthik, you want to be an automobile engineer? Oh, wow. Um. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Well, not fun, but... It sounds interesting because... Um, because there's a lot of, like, problem solving involved in that. You have to really, like think outside the box. So I'm sure that'll be a very creative and interesting job. Of course, what do I know? I'm not in that industry, but I imagine that's what it'd be like. Uh, little gamer, I haven't heard of the Spitfire. What, what kind of ship is it? Mike says he's watching Expedition Bigfoot. And it might be real, might not be, but <laughs> he lives in the woods and he hears lots of weird things at night. Yeah. I do not want to take a night walk in the woods. There's plenty of little patches of, like, natural woodlands around where I live. So if I wanted to take a walk at night, I could, in a way. But yeah, I would be too freaked out to be in the woods at night. Maybe not because of Bigfoot necessarily, but because of Bigfoot, yeah. Um, hello, the traveling suitcase. Ocean Liner Dude says, my favorite cruise liner is Queen Mary. Yeah, mine is too. Well, I mean, she's technically an ocean liner. Cruise liner is a cruise ship. Um, so Lifeboat 2 on Queen Mary was an accident lifeboat. Yes, so lifeboats one and two are accident lifeboats. Um, a lot of ocean liners, even today, have accident lifeboats. Um, they're smaller lifeboats that are more easily maneuvered and are faster. They're designed to do, like, various duties and stuff, you know. Um, they're, because of their, they're smaller and more maneuverable for that reason. But, yeah, so accident lifeboats can be used to... Like, let's say, like, like for instance, when Queen Mary uh, would encounter storms, sometimes she would pick up uh, distress signals from another ship where um, someone on that ship, maybe not a passenger ship, I think it's some freight ships as well, but, but uh, someone would fall and break their leg or break their arm and they needed immediate medical attention. Queen Mary had a nice big hospital aboard, so... Um, so if they needed to bring that person aboard, they would use the accident lifeboats to go over there and pick up the person in need of medical attention, drive them back to the Queen Mary, and then they'd lift the whole boat back up. And then, you know, so accident lifeboats are very useful for that purpose. Um. Oh, I see Ocean Liner, dude. Okay. Um... RMS Teutonic says, since you mentioned the woods, I got back from a three-day hiking camping trip recently, and it was phenomenal. Awesome. I used to do camping with my friends in high school. We used to go out to, like, Barstow and Ocotillo Wells, and, you know, and we would ride our... We had these uh, all-terrain vehicles called quads, and we also had dirt bikes as well. We would have fun and do that stuff. 
I can't imagine sitting on a quad today. <laughs> That's too dangerous. And dirt bikes do, too. They're too dangerous. I've gotten so cautious, you know, as I got older. But back then, I would just, vroom, just up the hills and up the dirt roads and, yeah. Crazy days. Brock says, what's your favorite ship movie? It would have to be James Cameron's Titanic. I just love that movie. I love it. Um, it's entertaining, you know. Um, but I recently saw 1972 Poseidon Adventure. I thought that was good. I liked it. Um, I could see myself watching that, you know, again very soon if I wanted to. Um, yeah, I love that movie. Um, and then pr everyone's telling me to watch 1900, and I will, but I have to rent it. So I, 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 I money is very tight. I have to be very careful where I spend money and what I spend money on. So recently I haven't been able to justify spending $4.00. I know that sounds crazy, but I couldn't justify it. But I think pretty soon things will be a, a bit better. So I think I will very soon rent the movie and just watch it. Because it sounds good. It sounds like a really good movie. Um. <laughs> Ivan says, wait, so retreated with random live in the woods and tea time. Yes, now. Yep. <laughs> I felt like I owed it to you guys. I promised a tea time and I have to deliver, you know? Sequad says... Oh, wait, no. Dangerous Brian says... I know it might be a stupid question, but what was the reason to build the lagoon for the Queen Mary? Why didn't they just leave her berth at the dock like a normal ocean liner? That's actually a very good question. There's, there's a lot of good reasons why. So... Basically, that um, breakwater, it's called a breakwater, it does several different jobs. Um, mainly, it's designed to calm the water around the ship. So if you actually look at, um, if you go there or if you look at drone footage around the ship, You'll notice that the harbor will be choppy, but if you look over the wall where Queen Mary's water is, it's extremely flat, just flat. And so even on the windiest days, the lagoon that Queen Mary sits in is flat. It does not get choppy at all. And that's a very good thing for museum ships because museum ships get what's called waterline corrosion. And that happens when, you know, the water is sloshing about like that and the constant wetting and drying wetting and drying wetting and drying of the steel oxidizes it really fast and that can wear away the steel at the water line opening up holes there's plenty of um there's plenty of uh of museum war ships uh like i think the the uss texas i think it's called or yeah, that's right, isn't it? Um, no. There is a USS Texas, but I'm not thinking of USS Texas. I'm thinking of another one that's in Texas. I don't know. But there's, there's like, old warships, right? And even though where they are is a very safe place, they experience waterline corrosion because the water around them just gets choppy. And so... Um, and so if you can calm the water, um, you can, you can uh, slow down the effects of waterline corrosion. So that was part of the reason, um, as well as the fact that that breakwater that surrounds the Queen Mary will also protect the Queen Mary in the event of a small tsunami. So, you know, on occasion, um, large earthquakes that uh, strike from Japan or, or from around Hawaii or whatever... Or even large underwater landslides can trigger tsunamis that reach the west coast. 
It's it's rare, but it happens. It's happened a few times since I was a little kid, and it's, they're never big. They're like they're like two foot, you know. They almost look like just a just a normal wave hitting the beach, but but you never know. Sometimes they could be real big, and you just you'll never know. But anyway, the point is is that the last thing you would want is for that to come into the harbor and slam against the Queen Mary and cause her to rock like this, because she will roll. She will, even though she's tied up to the pier, she will roll if she's hit by even like a two-foot tsunami. It will have some kind of effect. Um, but that that breakwater should slow the movement of the water coming into the lagoon to prevent that from happening. So that's another reason why she has the, the breakwater wall around her. But the final reason is also for collisions. You might have noticed there's a lot of boats and things that go through that harbor. Like lots of like privately owned boats and water taxis and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the breakwater wall prevents any of those boats from colliding with the Queen Mary because she is a very strong ship. Her steel hull is still one inch thick, even though she was manufactured at one and a quarter inches thick. So she's got a very thick steel hull even still, but you just never know. You don't want to risk anything hitting the Queen Mary, you know, because that would be a very expensive thing to fix. So that's another reason why they have the breakwater wall around the Queen Mary. And they can easily remove parts of the wall. I mean, I say easily, but it's expensive. It is time consuming, but they've done it in the past. When they put the submarine there, they had to remove part of the rock wall to scoot the submarine in there. So they've done it before, you know. Um, it's it's not the biggest deal in the world. It's just a pile of rocks. They just have a huge, you know, like earth moving machine go down there and scoop up the rocks and move them aside and all that stuff. So it's not like it's impossible, you know, it's just time consuming and takes some work, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so that breakwater wall does a lot for the Queen Mary and it's very, very good at that. In fact, you'll even notice, um, my friend Steve was telling me this the other day. Uh, you'll even notice that while the Harbor may have really cloudy, like completely sedimenty water, the Lagoon of Queen Mary can be really clear. So um, that's a big deal because a lot of the water that's in that harbor is like rainwater runoff sometimes from LA because the LA River is right there. That's the mouth of the LA River. And so LA is very polluted. And so when it rains, all the oils and dirts and chemicals that are on the streets run off into the, into the rainwater um, sewer system. And then they empty out through the LA River right there at the mouth of the harbor. And all that can be extremely corrosive water. It can be very bad for the ship. And that breakwater slows the movement of the water to the point where even though there's a rush of water coming out of the LA River on a really stormy day, uh, the water in the lagoon will stay relatively clear and calm because the breakwater slows all that movement. So actually the breakwater around the Queen Mary, the lagoon around the Queen Mary can sometimes be cleaner water than what's in the harbor so it does a lot of amazing work to keep the ship in great shape and frankly that's why she's still floating after 50 years of some would some people would say neglect um so that's yeah that's why that was a long explanation but i had fun talking about it mm. Oh yeah, little gamer's right. New companies exaggerate the condition of Queen Mary for clicks. Plus, if they exaggerate the condition of the Queen Mary, and then people visit the ship and see that she's not in that bad a shape, they'll think that the company who's taking care of the Queen Mary is doing a good job. So that's another reason why they do that. Brock says, why does Queen Mary 2 have small lifeboats at the front and big lifeboats in the middle and back? Um, so I actually just explained that earlier, but I don't, I don't think you were on the live stream yet. But the front two lifeboats on the Queen Mary, lifeboats 1 and 2, are called accident boats. 
they are mostly used on ships because they're smaller. They're used to do other duties, you know? So if, if there's ever a need to use a boat to transport somebody from the ship or to the ship, um, and it's just like a few people or something, they can use the accident lifeboats for that. But also, accident lifeboats can be used to, sur to survey um, areas of danger. So let's say for some reason the Queen Mary was on a cruise, like an actual cruise cruise, and they wanted to go through certain waters and they weren't sure how deep the waters were or something. They could use the accident lifeboats and drive out to the area where they want to sail the ship and just quickly survey it. That, that's really rare. That I don't think that even happens, but that could be a use for an accident lifeboat. So accident lifeboats, they're smaller, so that way they are more maneuverable and they can they can use them for utility purposes, um, you know, for stuff that's not necessarily dangerous. Um, so there's that as well. Oceanliner Dude says, that reminds me that Queen Elizabeth II was docked next to the Queen Mary. Really? When? Let's see. The, the QE2 was launched in 19... No, no, no. It was launched in 1968, but it went in service in 1969. Queen Mary was already in Long Beach at that point. As far as I know, Queen Mary and QE2 have never been next to each other. So I, I don't know about that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, see, Quad, I I know what you mean. I used to be a um, a props and designer for um, for uh, haunt mazes as well. I did that as a volunteer job actually, um, but I used to design haunt mazes and the special effects that went in them because sometimes we had some really interesting ideas that uh, we had to like invent special effects to make it happen. So I would do that too. It really, those were really fun years. I don't you know, honestly, uh, Dangerous Brian, I, I don't even know what the Spitfire is. I don't know about planes or ships or, you know, like, I don't, I have no idea what they were saying. Um, James says, are those chocolate digestives, Alex? Yes, they are. Um, I was, I've been eating the milk chocolate digestives. Um, but these ones are dark chocolate. I prefer dark chocolate, uh, so I'm actually really enjoying these. And it's actually time for me to refill my cuppa. So I have, um, I have the digestives, and I also have homemade Scottish shortbread. I make it, uh, here because it's cheaper than to buy it, honestly. Um, and it's easy to make, so it's not like a big deal or anything. Um, alrighty. Dangerous Brian says, this channel is mainly a ship channel. At the moment, it's mainly a ship channel, but I'm trying to branch out to other things. I'm trying to make it an, an everything about random history channel. Um, it's hard to do that because 
you know, I make a video about something and then the people who subscribe from that video are only interested in like that one thing usually. So what, what ended up happening was I was making a bunch of videos about Queen Mary and then all the o ocean liner enthusiasts came to the channel. So whenever I post stuff that isn't ocean liner related, uh, it doesn't really get views because um, people are here for the ocean liners. I'm trying to do more than just ocean liners. I love ocean liners, but I'm trying to do more than just ocean liners uh, because that is what will help the channel to grow. There's no limit to, you know, random history, but there is a limit to um, to ocean liner history. Uh, Sequad, uh, email me the story. Let me see what... As Karthik says, at the time when Queen Mary was being converted to a museum ship, couldn't it be transferred to a lake nearby, Long Beach, if they're... It, lake near... If they're... Then a saltwater... Um... Transferred to a lake. I mean, how do you plan to get the Queen Mary to the lake? <laughs> I mean, you can't just move, a, you know, a a ship that size, a thousand feet long, a, over the streets to a lake. You know, like the and the only lakes I can think of that would be big enough for the Queen Mary are far from the main areas of Southern California. Like, you're talking like a lake near. Um, a lake near, uh, oh, I forget the name of that city, but there's a lake on the other side of the mountains. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, it's, there's, you can't, you can't, not, not in, not in Southern California, not in California in general. Uh, there are no lakes that are right by the ocean like that, and none that are big enough for the Queen Mary, at least. So there's really, there was no where to put her. She has to be. And salt water is not a bad thing. It's, it's like I keep saying, you know how I always say, like, asbestos is not bad if you don't disturb it. Like, if you don't disturb it, it's safe. Same thing with salt water, except it's a little bit different. <laughs> salt water is perfectly fine for a ship if you maintain the sacrificial cathodic anode system and if you maintain the anti-fouling paint. Those two things, as long as you maintain those and you make sure that you're always checking up and making sure that, that it's in good condition, uh, then the, the ship will be perfectly fine sitting in salt water. No issues whatsoever. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, if as long as I keep up with that. And it seems it seems like the city of Long Beach is, is going to keep up with it. Um... This time, the city of Long Beach has full control of the ship, not a private company. So the city of Long Beach has been doing some interesting stuff for the ship. Uh, uh, the other day, they posted, well, the, well, the Queen Mary posted on Facebook that, um, sorry, I have to wipe my nose because it's, my allergies, it's blooming outside. My nose is constantly running because of the, because of the, the blooming, lots of pollen and stuff in the air. Um, but... Yeah, so they so the Queen Mary Hotel recently posted on Facebook that their the first class smoking room is getting a refurbishment. So they recently restored the floor, although the floor doesn't look original to me. So I'm not really sure how how much restoration work had to be done with that. But they said next is the walls of the room. The walls of the room. If you've seen the the first class smoking room on Queen Mary. The walls are in pretty bad shape, you know. They're extra dark because the, um, the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the varnish that's on the wood has darkened over the years. So the room is even darker than it used to be. Um, and then, of course, the varnish is very scratched up and damaged just from years of the ship just, you know, having people aboard. So that room is in dire need of some restoration work. And supposedly it's getting that restoration work. So I do imagine the ship will keep up with the sacrificial cathodic anode system and the anti-fouling paint, um, especially when the Queen Mary can be moved to a nearby dry dock. So they are considering building a dry dock nearby the ship uh, because 
they don't want to build one at the ship because that'll cost a lot of money and they'll only need to use it once every 25 years. Like not, no joke, they'll only use it once every 25 years. So that's a lot of money for something that's only going to be used that often. So they're thinking about building a nearby dry dock that is big enough for the Queen Mary, but um, can be rented out constantly to other ships that need it. You know, so it can be rented out to cargo ships, to military ships, and even to um, cruise ships. So, you know, yeah. So that'll be really cool. So I, I do have, I do, there is a silver lining, you know. Uh, uh, we'll see, little gamer. I'm, I'm not much of a enthusiast about airplanes. See, RMS Teutonic, please no politics or world news. We're here just to talk about ocean liners and stuff. A lot of people are stressed out about their lives, and this is a great way to kind of get away from all that. Ivan says, is there anything else you could use instead of dill in the cucumber sandwich? Just asking, because sometimes the shop here don't, doesn't have dill. I've used fresh sage before. Um, you have to use it sparingly, because fresh sage can be a bit strong by itself. But but um, I've used a little bit of fresh fresh sage before, and that that's okay. That that's It's a good substitute, but not the best. Um... The other thing is chives, so actual, like, um, like, chives. Not just green onion. Like, green onion is the really thick, straw-like thing, but chives are the really small, thin, hair-like onions with the green, you know. So, chives work really well in it, but I have yet to experiment with other stuff. I have tried dried dill, and it doesn't taste very good, in my opinion. So I don't like putting dried dill. Uh, someone else suggested um, dill pickles, actually. And the reason why is because you're eating cucumber, you're eating dill. What What is cucumber and dill? It's a dill pickle. So you might actually try doing a thin layer of cream cheese and mayonnaise. So you, you mix the two together. You add the salt. You add the, the garlic powder. You just spread that on the bread and then put dill pickles. That might be something close to... <laughs> Except it'll be very acidic because it's pickles. But dill pickles are generally very sweet, so uh, it shouldn't be too bad. But you might try that. Um, right, Tupi up. I know very little about the Cunarder train service. I know of its existence, and I know essentially where it went, but not very much, I'll be honest. Wade says, was the golden era for ocean liners about the same period as the golden era for railroads? Yes. In fact, the golden age for ocean liners, railroads, and... Um, I don't know what else, but it was called the Golden Age of Travel. So the Golden Age of Travel um, featured railroads and, and ocean liners. So it's generally about the same amount of time. Some people consider that the Golden Age of Ocean Liners ended in the 1950s. I don't consider that. Uh, I consider it ending, you know, at just before World War II, but that's just me. That's when I think the, you know, that's when I think the pinnacle of ocean liners just reached, you know, it, it got to the highest point, and from there it just went on a decline. So, I don't see the decline as part of the Golden Age. Um, and I'm not the only one that thinks that either. There's some people, some historians and stuff, 
they believe that the, the Golden Age ended just before the Second World War. So, that's why some people tell me, oh, SS United States is from the Golden Age. I'm like, I don't think it's from the Golden Age, in my opinion, but... Mr. Misty says QE2 could have docked in Long Beach during one of her world cruises. That's true, she could have, but I've never seen pictures of it. I'm, I almost feel like people would have taken pictures of it. I mean, they've taken pictures of, of Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria next to Queen Mary, and they've taken pictures of Queen Mary 2 next to Queen Mary, but I've never seen a picture of the QE2 next to the Queen Mary. If that happened, I'd love to see a picture of it. Because I really like the QE2. Emma says, why did we go from four funnels to three? Honestly, it's not like it was a whole movement. It wasn't like, oh, we have to switch. It was just things change, you know? The, the need for the funnels, everything changes. It's very complex. It's really, really complex. Um, some people like to simplify it, but you can't simplify it. It's because that's not true, you know? Like, funnels had their purpose. And even if a funnel was what some people might call a dummy funnel, it still did things it still exhausted air so um so it was useful but but uh the styles change the need for technology and how and how they use it changes so there was just so much change going on that four funneled ah, come on please that four funneled liners just weren't needed anymore YouTube S says, do you have any goal of subscribers for your channel? No, I only had one goal, and that was to reach 25,000. I've met that goal. Um, so now I don't... Um, I'm not a competitive person, so I don't have like this desire to have more and more and more. Like I'm not a competitive person. Um, I just wanted to reach 25,000 because I felt like that was a good milestone. That was a good... like. That was where I felt like I would have enough people watching that it would really make everything worthwhile and it is it makes everything worthwhile so um but i'm not competitive so i'm not just going ooh 100k next like i'm not like that if i reach 100k then i'll be so happy but i'm not gonna you know be going all over social media and be like get me to you know 100k you know Um, Brock says, why do people say the Queen Mary is small? When I went, it was big. It is big. I've had a few people say, oh, Queen Mary's small. And I'm like, when you really look at the size of the ship, its tonnage and its dimensions, it's right up there still with some of the biggest passenger ships in the world. There's no way by any means that is considered small. You know? Um... It's not like you see Oasis of the Seas pulling up to your local harbor every day. You know, it's it's it goes very specific places and you you don't just see it every day. But so that's, you know, one of the things but but um but yeah, it's not small. But I have heard people say it is small. And I don't think that they're considering the draft of the ship um because they look at what's above the water. And then go, oh, it's not that tall. But I'm like, all right, you know what? If you were to raise it up to the average, you know, depth of a modern cruise ship, you'll find that there's still a couple more, like, 
levels worth of height you can get out of the Queen Mary. But she sits so deep in the water, you wouldn't really know how big she is. Most ocean liners are like that, except for Queen Mary 2. She looks shallow if you took her out of water, but even though she's not that shallow, she looks shallow. But you look at ocean liners uh, in dry docks, and you would never guess there was that much <laughs> under the water, you know? You wouldn't think there's that much down there, but there is. It's it, Ocean liners, they sit very deep in the water. And Queen Mary, she has the same amount of decks as average cruise ships. You know, most average cruise ships have like 12 decks. Queen Mary has 12 decks. Uh, most average cruise ships are like 950 feet long. Queen Mary's 1,019 feet long. Um, you know, most cruise ships... Um, they're, you know, they have, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I, I don't know what else to add to that, but yeah, Queen Mary is by no means in, grouped in with small ocean liners. Like, she, she's not at all. She's still am amongst some of the biggest ships in the world. You know, after the Queen Elizabeth burned and sank, that made Queen Mary the largest ocean liner in the world for a, a short while. I think after SS France was destroyed, uh, Queen Mary became, for a very short while, the world's largest ocean liner. And then, um, and then she was beat by some cruise ship. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, Queen Mary is only recently not on the top of the list. Yeah, I think only like less than 30 years. Yeah, like maybe 25 years uh, is when she was last beat as the largest ocean liner. So, or largest passenger ship, I should say. So, um, yeah, I don't, I think some people just have an issue with size. They're just like, oh, this thing is not as tall as the Empire State Building. So... <laughs> Queen Mary is not a big ship. It's like, no, it's, it's, yes, silliness, it's silliness. Um, As Karthik says, I have a question. I came to know the Iowa-class battleships are of the same era as Queen Mary, and those battleships can be brought whenever needed. Can be brought? Brought where? Can't we at least try to move Queen Mary? I know you told many times it can't. Battle... The battleships are much smaller than Queen Mary. Um, by... <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> So moving the battleships is not as big of an endeavor as it would be to move Queen Mary. Even the battleships don't even sit as low in the water as Queen Mary does. The Queen Mary sits very deep in the water, about 38 to 39 feet underwater. That's a lot. Um, and like I said, they're big. Like Queen Mary is, is bigger than the battleships by far. So I, yeah, I don't, it's not the same. It's not the same. And Queen Mary's much taller than the battleships as well. Really, really tall. Almost two, almost 200 feet above the waterline kind of tall. Um, so yeah, it's that's why it's, you know... The Queen Mary can be moved in her harbor. So if you move her from one side of the Long Beach Harbor to the other, it shouldn't be a problem. But you wouldn't want to move her across the oceans. So, and, and you also have to consider those... Those battleships were kept in really good condition for a longer period of time than Queen Mary was. Some of those battleships, like the USS Iowa, were, were actually off and on in service, uh, even until the 1990s, I believe. So, um, so they were kept in really good working condition for much longer than Queen Mary was. And Queen Mary's been out of service for over 50 years. Uh, so that's a long time, you know, so she, so even though they're from the same era, they weren't taken care of the same way. Um, uh, 
Wade says you can grow dill if you have a garden. Same for chives, that's true. To S. Karthik talking about the four funneled ships having only three operational. That's not necessarily true. Usually on four funneled ships that, that didn't need the fourth funnel for exhausting boiler gases, like Titanic, Olympic, Britannic, they use the fourth funnel to exhaust kitchen smoke and to exhaust um, old air from the ships. So it's exhausting. So it, it's the same thing. It's, it, it's doing its job. It's technically a useful funnel. So, um, but, you know, you had Mauritania, for instance, that used all four funnels for boilers. So, yeah. Hello, Titanic Gaming. Um, thank you. Um, oh, see you later, Mike. Chris Butler says, hi, all. What's happening here on the Alexander and Western Railroad? Not much. We're just catching up. Drew says, are you going to do on the brief history on the Queen Mary? And do you think it's a possibility that they will add new lifeboats to her? Um, hmm. Well, I, I, I make videos on Queen Mary history all the time, so I'm not done yet with the history. But, um... As for your lifeboat question whether they will add new lipos to her. It's really the wrong question to ask because the lifeboats are not currently on their list of things to do. So that's all I can really say about it because that's, that's all there is, you know. I'm not going to say they can't and I'm not going to say they will because we don't know. We, we don't know if they will or if they can or cannot. Um, all we know is it's not on their list of things to do. So in the future, if maybe if we all band together and, and try to convince the city of Long Beach to allow QMI to fund um, building replica lifeboats and refurbishing the Davits to put them back up there, then maybe we can have that someday. Um, but, um, but yeah, as far as I know, it's, it's, it's not on a, on a list of things to do. Wade says, I'm having a brisket sandwich with my iced tea. Cheers. Cheers, Wade. Ivan says, is there a Scotland Road type of corridor on Queen Mary? Um, yes, there is. So, sadly, it doesn't have a name. <laughs> but I kind of wished it did. But, but yes, there is a corridor. Um, only half of it exists today. But it was on C deck, so just underneath R deck. Um, and it pretty much ran from the front area of the ship all the way to the stern. Um, and there was all kinds of um, maintenance facilities and even food storage facilities as well because they had pantries down there and they had refrigeration systems um, because uh, Queen Mary had one of the largest refrigeration systems of any ocean liner at the time uh, beat only by Queen Elizabeth um, if that but yeah so she did have a long corridor eventually part of sea deck was removed to make way for the um, museum space at the stern of the ship so they needed a, a taller museum lobby. So they removed part of Sea Deck. 
Um, but still, about half of the length of that corridor still exists on the ship. Uh, we're going to talk more about that um, eventually on one of the, the Saturday streams where we talk about the Queen Mary's lost and abandoned places. So this coming Saturday, I think we're going to be talking about the lounges. But I think after that, we might talk about the C deck and D deck areas amidships. Excuse me. The pollen is getting to me. I'm not normally allergic to stuff, but uh, but there's just so much, so so much pollen. Um. Titanic Gaming says, "Did you hear about the RMS Titanic 2 coming out soon?" I don't know where people are hearing this stuff. It was canceled last year. And they've been talking about RMS Titanic 2 since I was a little kid. You know, I knew since I was a small child that would never happen. The guy is crazy. The, the, the what's his name? Um, the, the Australian billionaire. Clive Palmer. He was, ever since I was a kid, he's, he was a crazy, very strange man. So um, I knew that he would never finish that thing, and they canceled it last year, and I was like, okay, well, I, I knew it wouldn't happen. I mean, I don't think anybody would actually fork over the money in huge droves to make that ship popular. Yeah, Jason Carr said it, yeah. I, he says, I heard that rumor since the early 90s. It ain't gonna happen. Yeah, like... I heard it in the early 90s as well. I was a little tiny kid when they first announced it. And I was like, that's not going to happen. Because I knew already, I was like, people like cruise ships. They don't like ocean liners anymore. So you would never get enough people staying aboard the Titanic. Especially considering its massive expense. You know. Um, but yeah. It, as far as I'm aware, it was canceled last year. He's getting... Clive is becoming an older older gentleman. So he's losing his, uh, his drive to complete it. Thank you, Ivan. Dangerous Brian says, Alex, have you ever thought about trying to get this channel monetized? It is monetized. That's why you see ads before the videos. Hold on, I'll look, look something up for you guys. Yeah, all the information about Titanic 2 dates back to 2021 at the soonest. So there's been no updates about about 2022. Yeah, I don't know. Like, you guys really shouldn't believe everything you hear. Uh, because I've been, like I said, this ever since I was a little boy... This person's been talking about it, and it's never happening. It, originally, he was planning to have it sail uh, in, like, the year 2002. That was, like, originally when it was supposed to sail. It was 2002. And then he pushed it to 2004. Then he pushed it to 2006. And then at one point, it made a big leap, and he said 2016. And then after that, it was like, oh, we don't know. And then last year, he's like, 2022. And it's like... No, it's not going to happen. He, they haven't even begun construction on it. They don't have any designs or blueprints or anything. All they have is, like, two pieces of concept art. But they've never actually, like, built any blueprints. It's not a, it's not a serious thing. So, 
Um, oh, Chris Butler says that uh, uh, that the alleyway on Queen Mary uh, post World War II was referred to as the Burma Road. Wow, I haven't heard of that before. That's pretty cool because I always thought that it should have a name, you know. If Scotland Road was a thing on Titanic, Queen Mary should have one. Jason Carr says, well, in China, it's a permanent structure. Oh, you're thinking about the other the other Titanic. Um, so there's two Titanics that were supposedly under construction. There's the theme park one, which, uh, which was canceled as well because that theme park, they ran out of money and they had to stop. Um... So that one was was um, canceled last year, and the, the whole construction site. I saw some video taken this year of the construction site. It's completely overgrown. There's like plants growing on the on the hull of the Titanic and stuff. That that one just ran out of money, and you know it's completely overgrown. Um, but Clive Palmer's sailing Titanic, the one that actually would sail as a cruise ship, not as an ocean liner, um, that one is also pretty much like never going to happen. Um, ocean liner dude says the the ocean liner one is still in its design phase yeah it's been in its design phase since i was a little boy and i'm now an older i'm getting be, becoming older now so <laughs> you know it's it's not gonna happen Clive Palmer, you, there's something you need to know about Clive Palmer, you, uh, you, you guys, uh, especially for the younger folks in my audience. He is a very eccentric man. Um, he has all these big, grand ideas, the biggest one being the Titanic 2. Uh, and, and then there's some other famous ideas he has, and, but they're, that's all they are, is just really grand ideas that they won't get completed <clears throat> because they don't make sense. You know, the Titanic 2 would not be able to earn enough revenue to keep itself going, you know? And it wouldn't offer enough things to make it worthwhile to make the project done. So it's just, it's not going to happen. That's why it's never been built yet. Ever Like I said, ever since I was a boy, he's been saying, oh, we're going to open it 2002, 2004, 2006, 2016, you know, 2022. It's like, it's just not going to happen. And I don't mean to sound happy about that. It's just that, you know, like, I was, when I was a little boy, I was excited because I thought that'd be so cool to see a new Titanic. But as I grew older into an adult, I just kind of realized how much of a strange idea it was and how impractical it was. So, you know, I'm not happy that it's not being built. I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of like, it's, you know... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to... I don't even know what to, like, make an example that works with... You know, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how else to say it, but... Um, Hello, Katie. I'm doing good. How about you? Luke Michael B says, why does Queen Mary 2 only have one funnel? Because they only need one funnel. Um, funnels are only put on ships as they're needed. Um, and Queen Mary 2 does not need two funnels. She only has one engine room, so they only have one funnel, you know. Uh... Uh, 
As Karthik says, can Queen Mary travel in inland waters? Is her draft deep enough to go down a river? It really depends on what river you're talking about. Not all rivers have the same depth, so... But, yeah, I don't I don't know. I couldn't tell you what depth rivers are. I mean, you know, the, the River Clyde in Scotland is where she was built, so yeah, she could sail down that river, you know. They dredged it deeper, but I mean, you know, they... You know, it, she did, but... But, uh, but yeah, um... Yeah, I don't know. I, all rivers have different depths, so I, I can't imagine she could just sail down any river, you know. Um, and when she would go to New York, technically that was the um, the Hudson River, so she was able to sail up partially up the Hudson. Uh... Martin, I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, so if you could rewrite it, I'll try to answer it. S. Karthik. Yeah, Queen Mary's almost 90. Right, to Piep, other than Normandy, are there any other ocean liners you actually dislike? Oh, of course. You know, it's it's like being a it's like being a car fanatic. You don't when you're a car fanatic, you you don't like every car. You have your favorites. You have ship. You have cars that you like. And so, same thing with me. Like I'm an ocean liner f enthusiast, but I have ocean liners that I don't like. Um, my Normandy video was a misnomer. I don't hate Normandy. It's just that if you, I found that amongst ocean liner communities, if you say anything negative about a ship, they will consider you a hater. So I named the video, I hate SS Normandy, because there are a lot of things that I didn't like about SS Normandy and people would paint that as me being a hater. That's why I made the video. Unfortunately, people didn't understand it when they watched it. They thought I literally hate Normandy. They thought the video was about all my hate for the SS Normandy, and it's not. It was supposed to be just a fun video to watch, and it was just taken, you know, not the way I intended it to be. Um, but yeah, of course, just like any enthusiast, I have my favorites. I have ones that I dislike. So I've learned from my SS Normandy video that you just don't open your mouth. You don't say what ships you don't like, because... Everybody who is so sensitive will become personally insulted from it, you know, and I hope that one day in the future people will learn to be less sensitive. Uh, I think it's okay to express your opinions. I think it's okay to say, like, you know, what's your favorite thing versus what's not your favorite thing. But there are people out there who get so personally insulted when you don't like what they like. And, you know, the world is a beautiful place, but it's beautiful because we we don't always agree on the same things. It's beautiful because, you know, you walk into to, to large cities like San Francisco and you'll see all kinds of architectural styles. You'll see Victorian styles, Edwardian styles. You'll see modern, um, like, uh, 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 mid-century styles and even the latest you know, um, 2000s architecture and stuff. So, you know, and 1930s Art Deco style in the form of, uh, in, in the form of its two bridges. So, you know, um, and it's, it's, what makes our world so beautiful is the fact that we all have different opinions on stuff. And so, yeah, I think people need to learn to be more accepting of hearing opinions that people don't agree with, you know? That'd be nice, uh, because, you know, I may not... SS Normandy may not be my favorite. I can appreciate the ship. I can appreciate its architecture, its design. I can appreciate its contribution to the Art Deco age. I can, I can appreciate all that stuff without having it as my favorite. Um, but some people don't think you can, so, um, that's really unfortunate, but, um, 
Right, two pip says when you're poor you get called insane, but when you're rich you get called eccentric. That's that's kind of true. I try to use the word eccentric instead of insane or crazy for anybody, whether you're poor or rich, and that's that's because uh, you know it's it, it's 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 impolite to call someone crazy or insane. So I use the term eccentric uh, for anybody that I think is is crazy or insane. Um, Martin Morris says, why were the lifeboats taken off the Queen Mary? Um, the reason why is because, uh, so, uh, well, I talked about it in a really long live stream recently, so I suppose it would be kind of too much to ask you to see the whole thing. But, um, but basically, so the davits on the Queen Mary that hold up the lifeboats, the davits extend down below the sun deck into the bottom of the promenade deck. And, the, and those davits not only support the weight of the lifeboats, but they also partially support the weight of the sun deck above as well. And unfortunately, due to um, the fact that the ship's various neglect has led to some rainwater leakage, the rainwater has gotten down into the bottom of the promenade deck and rotted out some of the bottoms of the pillars of the davits. And so all the weight was then transferred to the side shell of the promenade, which wasn't designed to support all the weight. And so the side shell was starting to come off of the promenade deck. And they were worried that um, in time, it could have led to a partial uh, collapse of sun deck onto promenade deck. And so um, the lifeboats were removed to mitigate that. Now, if they wanted to repair those davits, they would have had to remove the lifeboats from the ship anyway. The only thing that I don't agree with is that they th they threw away a significant number of lifeboats. Thankfully, they kept, I think, I think so far, the, there are five, six, seven, there are eight lifeboats that have not been disposed of, three of which will stay with the ship. Um, the other five, we don't know the future of. Hopefully, we can restore them and maybe we can put them back up on the ship someday. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, what was I saying about the lifeboats? Yeah, so, they didn't have to be thrown away. There were other options. QMI tried to give other options, um, but things just went the way that they went, and, uh, unfortunately, we did lose a significant number of lifeboats, all original to the ship or to Cunard ships in general. None of them were replicas. None of them were fake lifeboats. They were all real lifeboats, uh, from... The, the Cunard days. Um, and they were made of steel, not wood. So they, you know, some people go, oh, well, they were made of wood. They would have, you know, they would have been done anyway. And it's, well, not necessarily. It's like I always say, if you put in the effort to restore something, it will last, um, even if it's made of wood. But uh, these were made of steel. So, you know, they, yeah. It is what it is. We, you know, I think those, those lifeboats uh, are destroyed it's done. There's nothing I can do about it anymore. So I think right now we should focus on the other eight lifeboats and see what we can do. I would love to see the five that are set aside plus the the fourth one. No, I'm sorry. Plus the sixth one that is on the pier put back up on top of the ship someday. That'd be cool. I don't mind having one of the lifeboats on ground level. At least it lets people get up close to it and see it and stuff. So maybe we'll keep one down there and refurbish it and let people see it as it should look. But uh, it shouldn't be out in the elements like that. It, we should build like a like a shed or something, like a glass, in, in you know glass enclosure or something that people can walk into and see it. But uh, that's you know that's far into the future. But hopefully, you know I like to say, you never know until you try. So many people have said, well Alex, why do you even bother? 
you know, helping QMI? Why do you bother talking about the Queen Mary and, you know, all this stuff? Some people have even, you know, um, chastised me for, um, uh, for, chast no, Ch chided? Chided, it's chided, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god chided me for um <laughs> some people have chided me for giving people false hope i don't see it that way i tell things as they are if the news if you know not the news if the information says that um you know that queen mary's hull is an inch thick and that there has never been leaks from the seawater, just from the internal structure. That's a good sign. That's that's a really good sign. But people, I think some of these people, they love doom and gloom. They want me to tell them the ship is going to sink. And it, but the thing is that the information says it's not. You know, so, um, so yeah, it's uh, yeah. But I do try to instill a little bit of hope in people, and I think the reason why is because. It's like I said, you don't know until you try. If you if you don't try to help the Queen Mary, you'll never know whether you could have. And some people are just so happy. Like, it's so sad. There are people who come from Facebook onto my channel to get mad and insult me over what I do on Queen Mary videos. And I'm just sitting here going, what are you guys doing? You know, like, not you guys, but them. You know, I'm like... What are you guys doing? Are you are you trying to help the ship in any way? You know, like, don't get mad at the people who are trying to help. You know, that's that's completely a backwards idea. Um, so it's just like, you know, some people are just like, oh, you know, like everything you do about the Queen Mary and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, at least I'm trying to do something to help a ship I really love. A ship I really want to see become successful someday and... And, you know, I'd, li I'd love to go there in my old age, you know, with my nieces and nephews and, you know, and see the ship. You know, it's so you, you just don't know if you don't try. And frankly, you know, I'm the kind of person I've always been the kind of person where I felt like if you if you want to make a difference, you have to you have to get up and do something. And that's what I've done. I have made a lot of networking connections with people to try to figure out what we can do, establish game plans, you know, how can we help the ship? And it's very limited, you know, the city of Long Beach, um, their involvement with the public on the Queen Mary is really very, very limited, to, to put it nicely. Very, very limited. So it's you can't just walk up to city the city of long beach holding a paint bucket and a paintbrush and go all right i'm here to help like you can't do that they they'll just say no get out of here go away you know like they don't they don't want people going on there and fixing up the ship they want to do it a certain way they they have their own thing that they do and so we have to play the you know the the political game to you know to show them that we're trying to help and stuff. So that's what I try to do for my, my channel. <laughs> Chastise. Yeah, you know what? I need to look up that word. I feel like I know the, the definition of that word, but I can't think of it at the moment. <laughs> uh, no, it is a right word. It is the right word. Rebuke or reprimand severely to chastise someone. So I said it right. The first time. I don't know why, but I'm like, what is that? What word was I thinking it meant? Let me see. Uh, uh, Ah, okay. I can't say that word. <laughs> I can't say that word on, on here. Um, let's just say that when I originally said the word chastise, for some reason I, I had to stop myself because I'm like, wait, am I saying the wrong word? And I thought for a minute I was saying the wrong word. I was like, oh. So I looked up the word right now and I'm like, oh, that's the word I thought I might have accidentally been saying. 
and I can't say that word on here. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, chided is another word. I, I think it's C H I D E D. Chided. Um. Uh, oh, see you later, Sequad. See you later, Titanic Gaming. That's right. Chris Butler's right. The Queen Mary is technically in the Los Angeles River. Uh... To be honest, Conrad, things like sarcasm and also um uh what's that other form of comedy um i can't think my brain is so like i'm so tired after that that hike um but there's another word for like when you when you make a joke by acting Serious and it's not sarcasm. It's another word. I can't think of the I can't think of the word. Like my brain doesn't want to work right now. I'm drinking tea and it's not waking me up anymore. So let's see. Um Glenn, you can't say that on here. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, I have to delete that. Oh my goodness. Uh, let's see, remove. Uh, let's see. Everyone's like, yeah. Yeah, chide and chastise both mean to rebuke. I, I was thinking of some... I was just afraid that I was using a word because I know what those words mean, but I'm so, I'm so tired and exhausted that I, for a split second, I thought I accidentally used a different word. Uh, and the word I thought I was using scared me. I was like, Oh, I hope I did not say that out loud because that is not the right word. But, um, yeah. John says satire. Yes. So satire is the other form of comedy satire. Yes. So sarcasm and satire are becoming like, like totally cha Well, first of all, people are still sarcastic, but they don't understand old sarcasm. And then satire, forget it, forget satire. People do not understand satire anymore. I used to love satire. I, I thought it was a great like form of comedy, but people take it to take it too literally. And you can't take satire literally because well, then you'll get insulted. So, yeah, there are some people that are just really sensitive to satire. And that's... <sighs> yeah. But, anyway. Um... Uh... <laughs> Oh, I can't even say it, Glenn. I can't say it, because uh, if I say it... Because oh, this is like a family channel. If I was on my other channel, I could tell you. I'll type it up, and then I'll delete it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, this thing is... I need to clean the track again. So, so once Glenn sees that, I'm going to delete that comment because I can't say it out loud. But it made me laugh. It made me laugh. Um... <laughs> Everyone's like, way to go, Glenn. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Did 
Drew says, have you seen the High Seas series on Netflix? Because when I watched that ship in the TV series, it almost looks like Queen Mary. That's funny because they the, they designed the outside of that ship on that series to, to be Queen Mary, essentially. So yes, I've seen the series. Uh, the only image of Queen Mary they used in the series is uh, is at the first episode when they're uh, driving up to the ship, they used a very far away photo of the Queen Mary to represent the ship. Um, but that's about it. Uh, everything else was all either CGI or practical sets. Uh, but even the practical sets, none of them look like rooms on the Queen Mary. It's very European art deco instead of British art deco. Um, yeah, so, okay, now I'm going to delete my comment. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I got through maybe five episodes of that show, but I, I'll be honest, I got a bit bored. I didn't, uh, it wasn't entertaining to me. Um, right to Piep says, sarcasm and satire is the foundation of Britain. Yep, exactly. I gotta end the live stream soon. Hour and 45 minutes, I think it's been. Who texted me? Gosh, so I can't wait till the Queen Mary reopens because I want to try to go down there. I, I got a friend that, um, I mean, he lives uh, up in Idaho. It's the other Steve. It's the Steve R. So, and I often like go places with uh, with Steve. And so, I told him I was like, "Hey, you know, when the Queen Mary reopens, if you happen to be going down to Southern California, I'll go with you." You know, because um, I really want to get new footage of the ship. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Well, plus I'm also just dying to go back on the ship. Honestly, like. I, I wasted so much of my time the last time I was on there because I didn't expect, I didn't realize that in the near future I would be, I would be so obsessed with the Queen Mary. So I wasted so much of my time on the ship just kind of wandering around and just doing nothing, you know, and, and, and now I look back on that and I'm like, oh, I could have gone into that room, I could have gone into that room, I could have filmed this, I could have filmed that, and... I could have used all that footage and, but, uh, but the good news is, is that I, I think some of the public spaces on the ship are getting some renovations, like minor renovations. So it, the ship will look, I think a little bit prettier. I mean, dare I say, maybe they're replacing some of the worst carpets on the ship. Some of the carpets that are literally just duct taped together. Um, they might be replacing some of those because they're, because they're, um, you know, they're, they, they, they said they're refurbishing the smoking room, so I don't see why they wouldn't try to replace some of the carpets. Those carpets were so torn up and old. My God. But, um... <laughs> yeah, Conrad, you're right. Uh... Anaro, I can't pronounce that. I'm back from crossing and happy to say was not disappointed. Awesome. What, uh, what ship did you cross on? Nightfall says this may this may have been asked 
already, but have you seen the movie Titanic and did you look for structural inaccuracies? Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I love the movie Titanic. I watch it a lot, but do I look for structural inaccuracies? No, because I don't know the Titanic well enough to be able to see structural inaccuracies. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I'm not ashamed to say I just don't, I, I don't know much about the Titanic compared to other people. So when I see the movie, I don't really see too many things different to me. Like, cause I, I don't, I don't know, you know, um, I know that there are things in the movie that are inaccurate. Uh, I can name some of them, but, uh, but ultimately I, 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 I don't know enough to be able to decipher uh, completely inaccurate things. Um, Drew says, I heard rumors there is a ghost in Letty's room on the Queen Mary. Honestly, there's rumors about ghosts all over the ship. It, I mean... There isn't a square inch of that ship that someone hasn't said they saw a ghost. Um, Chris says, I'll be there when she reopens. I look forward to meeting you when we are old, back in the old teak again. Won't it be fantastic to be back? Oh, it will be very fantastic. And yeah, I'd like to meet you. Um, maybe we'll go see if your painting is still on the ship. <laughs> um, Conrad says... Alex, your leisurely stroll on the Queen Mary might have helped you fall in love with her. I think so. Well, it looks leisurely, but when I filmed the thing, it was a very hectic vlog. Like, I didn't film it to be a tour. I filmed it to be, like, a vlog. So it was just me with the camera at my face going, like, Oh, I'm on the Queen Mary. I'm trying this thing. And, oh, I'm now I'm walking in this room. And this room was used for this and that and blah, blah, blah. And it was, like, really hectic. And... When I decided to delete that video, because it was so embarrassing, it was so embarrassing, but when I decided to delete the video, I thought, well, I could try to use, I could try to salvage some of the footage and use it as a walkthrough tour. And like I said in my recent, because um, I did a, a commentary on that, so if you guys want, so if you guys have already seen the virtual narrated tour of the Queen Mary that I did, the other day, I think yesterday, I made a, com a, a live stream commentary of it. So we watched it together and I, I talked more about the ship as we watched it together. Um, but yeah, in, in, that, uh, in that live stream, I talked about how I, it was so hard to re-edit the footage because it was so hectic. I was moving the camera here and there and it was just crazy. It was not leisurely. And, and I had to edit it and slow it down. So I had recorded it in 60 frames per second. In some cases, I slowed it down to 20 frames per second um, because sometimes I'd just move from here to here. And there's like a scene at the beginning of the tour where I'm looking down the hallway and the camera is slowly like dropping towards the floor. That happened like this in real life. Like, I'm not kidding, it just happened like that in real life. And it was so like quick. And so I knew that if I wanted to take a moment to talk about that hallway, I had to slow the footage down. So I slowed the footage down, like, I think down to like 10 frames a second, honestly, something like that, like something crazy. I slowed it down really slow. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so I had to do so much editing to make that a smooth, calm virtual tour. And there was so much wasted footage, you know, like like for every for every shot I had of the ship, I had a shot of me on the camera and I couldn't use that. So I had to just remove it. So um, but next time I go on the ship, I'm going to film as much of the ship I possibly can. I'm going to go everywhere I possibly can go film it in really high quality 4K, you know, nice and smooth, all that. And that way I can make all kinds of virtual tours in the future. I can use the footage to make more videos about the Queen Mary because some of the things like I'd love to make videos where I talk about like the second class library. Well, I never went there, so I didn't take footage of it. And the only photos that exist are really gross photos. And the more footage I have, the better the video will be. So if I can go to the ship and film everything, just fill it up with 4K footage, that will make for really good videos. Uh, 
That's right, this week is going to be the 86th anniversary of Queen Mary's Maiden Voyage. That's going to be this Friday, the 27th. I have to come up with a video or something to post that day, something to commemorate, you know, the Queen Mary's 86th anniversary. Conrad says, do you think it's a waste of time to try to dispel the notion of Queen Mary being haunted? Kinda. You know, 30 years of telling people it's haunted has ruined its reputation permanently. So you can't really get rid of that now. You just kind of have to find ways to work around it. There are ways to work around it, you know. Um, it won't be easy. It'll be hard to convince large amounts of, um, of the public to come visit the ship. I forgot, I, I went hiking today, so there's mud on my shorts, and I'm like, did I just poop myself or something? I'm like, my God, but it's mud. Um, so, um, but uh, yeah, so it will be really difficult to, to convince the average public to come to the ship because a lot of people, they say, oh, I never want to go to the Queen Mary. I heard it's so haunted. I don't even want to be around it. And I'm like, that really is bad for business. You don't want people saying that because then people will never go. And I've had people on my channel tell me, they're like, oh, I, you know, I can't believe you're making videos about the Queen Mary. It's so haunted. I would never go there. And I'm like, it's such a beautiful ship. There's so much history. Like, I wish people would put aside their fear of ghosts, because honestly, I do believe in ghosts. Do I think the Queen Mary's as haunted as people say it is? No, I think it might be a little bit haunted, but I don't think it's not anywhere nearly as, like, demonic as people say it is. Um, I've been there multiple times in my life. It's always been such a happy, wonderful ship, you know? It's got a history of, you know, people enjoying their time there it's it it felt like a happy ship being on the queen mary i never felt any kind of creepiness or anything it doesn't help that all the lights turn the walls green because the lights are all fluorescent and it doesn't work well with the type of uh wood that's on the ship so it all looks green but um yeah so it will be really difficult to convince people the ship isn't haunted um Drew says, is tea your favorite drink? Because my favorite drink is Coke and Pepsi, and maybe we will cheers when the Queen Mary opens. My favorite drink of choice is root beer. Um, but the thing is, is I, I don't drink soda that much anymore. You know, I, I'm getting a little bit older, and as I get older my stomach and my body just don't react the same way to certain things. So like, I've always been a coffee person, for instance. I've always, I like, when I was a teenager, I drank coffee like it was water. I always had a coffee in my hand. And, um, but now that I'm older, I can't even drink coffee. It, it makes me feel like terrible. I, I get heart palpitations and I'm out of breath and it's just not, it's, it's not good. It gives me like hypertension or something. I don't know. But, uh, so I, I, I still need my my pick me up, and so I I chose black teas uh, because I can prepare them as if I would prepare coffee. And frankly, I've kind of switched over to tea permanently now. So I barely have. I, the other day I went to Starbucks and got a latte. My God, I did not feel good afterwards. I just I can't, you know. So there's things like that. Um, I just yeah. I and then the soda. Uh, I haven't had a soda in months. I think at least, at least since I moved into this place, which was in February, was the last time I ever had a soda. And even then, before that was like six months. So I haven't, come on. So I haven't drank too many sodas anymore. When I was a kid, I drank soda all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, it. certain foods don't sit well with me anymore as I get older. So I've had to change what I eat, what I drink. And, um, you know, yeah, not, not even because I'm trying to be healthy. It's just, I don't want to die. <laughs> I'm like, some of these foods makes me feel now like I'm going to die as I sit here eating like a buttery shortbread. But yeah, you know. Uh, Martin Morris says, do you like paddle boats? Yes, I love Mississippi 
uh, stern wheelers. Love them. One day I will make some videos on a few Mississippi stern wheelers. I will. I just, I'm just, I'm just working up to it. There's, you know, there's so much stuff to do, but, but yes. Um, and in fact, one day I planned, I, someday, I don't know when, but I, I will plan to go to New Orleans. Um, and I plan to do just like I want to do for the UK trip. I want to, um, I want to film all of the French Quarter, every inch of it I possibly can, so I can make as many videos as I can out of it. Um, but the other, th the other thing I want to do is I want to take a trip aboard the Natchez, um, so I can make a few um, videos out of about stern wheelers and paddle boats and things on the Mississippi. So yeah, I do love those kinds of boats. Um, and there's plenty of boats to talk about when it comes to the Mississippi. Um, So, um, yeah. Conrad says, is it true if you toss a penny or pence over your shoulder off of the Queen Mary, you would have a return voyage like Trevi Fountain in Rome? I don't know, but what I can almost guarantee you is that you may kill a fish someday doing that. Let's see. Rytopia says, I have spent so much time in historic places and I've never seen, never once seen anything paranormal. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i been to a lot of places and never seen paranormal stuff. I do believe in the paranormal because I've, I, I've been around haunted places and I've seen ghosts myself. But I don't see them nearly as much as people say they do. I think most of these places that people advertise as haunted are just haunted for the money honestly like i've been to some pretty like like some places that some people consider very haunted like i've been to tombstone arizona and they say some of the buildings there some of the mines there are so scary haunted i've been there i'm like i don't feel anything you know like so i think it comes and goes but you know like i think like still the, the scariest place i've ever been that was haunted was when I worked at the Golden Horseshoe at Disneyland. That was scary. That was the only place that made me feel like I was in danger. <laughs> that was it. But I've been to a lot of museums, a lot of historic places, you know, and even the Queen Mary, which is said to be like the top 10 most haunted place in the United States. I've been there several times in my life. I never felt that way. Never f seen a ghost there for for fully real but there is a person who watches my channel who posted a video and i love this video because it is kind of creepy so the person was on the queen mary on our deck going past the the doorway to the first class swimming pool going towards the doorway to the first class main restaurant and this person was only filming a walkthrough of the ship that's it that's all they were there for was to film a walkthrough they don't make videos about the hauntings or anything they just do walkthroughs and so as they panned the camera to turn around, because they were going to turn around and go back the way they came. As they panned the camera to turn around, they came towards like where the doors of the first class main restaurant are. And a cabinet completely just opens. Like that. Just completely opens. Now that was scary. <laughs> um, especially since the ship is tilted two degrees to the port side for proper rain drainage. And because it's tilted to the port side a little bit, there should be no reason why the cabinets on the starboard side would open outwards. If anything, they would close inwards. So that was pretty weird. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. Chris Butler says, in 50 years, yes, 50 years of visiting Queen Mary and in all my time as a tour guide, I never saw anything ghostly. Yeah, see, I believe that, you know. I Yeah, I mean, the closest I ever got was I was walking through the propeller room, the, the um, not the propeller room, the um, shaft alley. And I was I had the camera on and over to my left, I could have sworn I saw someone walking down the catwalk. I turned my head and there was no one there. Um, but that could have easily been an obstruction or something that in the corner of my eye looked like a person. Uh, but um, 
But that's about it. I've, I've never seen any ghosts on the ship. So... Yeah. I never felt creeped out on the Queen Mary either, you know? Some people have said, like, oh, I feel... I get the heebie-jeebies being on the ship. And I'm like, I don't feel that way. Like, I felt totally comfortable. Like, it, it felt welcoming, if anything. Like, it felt really welcoming. Um, let's see... Thank you, Glenn, for the, the comment about the Rex video. Drew says, have you sailed on the Queen Mary 2? Um, no, but... So I, I do want to do something, and I will, I will kind of plug this in here now. I do really want to take a trip to the UK and to film a bunch of historic places so I can make videos about them. Come on, move. Um, to make videos about the, these historic places. the I have like a full list of everything, all the places I want to go. Um, London, Bristol, Southampton, um, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and then a trip to Paris, France. Uh, all this is part of like one big trip. And the way to get there is me and my friend would take the uh, Queen Mary 2 across the Atlantic on a transatlantic crossing. So I think the whole trip is closer to like 24, 25 days or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but I want to do it to film stuff for the channel. So, you know, anywhere from 50 to 150 new videos in the future, plus any extra footage I can use to make new videos in the future, because I can always use extra footage to make new stuff. Um, but yeah, so if you guys want to learn more about that or you want to donate to it, um, there should be a link to it. Uh, in the description of this video. If not, just go to my uh, channel homepage and there should be, you'll, you should be able to see it. It's called um, my UK filming trip or something like that. Um, yeah, so let me check the description of this video real quick to make sure it's all the information's in there. Yeah, yeah, it's in there. So it says here, I plan to sail to the UK to film dozens upon dozens of historic places for this channel. If you would like to learn more about it, you can watch the video link below, or you can learn from my GoFundMe page, where you can also help support the effort so I can accomplish this goal much sooner. So there's two links there, a video link so you can learn about the trip, and then GoFundMe. So if you want to support that, you can support that. Um, because I would really like to do this as soon as possible. I am saving up my own money to do it, but at this rate, it'll probably be 10 years before I save up that money. So if you guys want to see videos on the UK much sooner than 10 years from now, um, who knows, maybe I can still have a tiny chance of going this year. We'll see. But if you want to donate to that, you can. And that's on my GoFundMe page. Um, and of course, you can support me other ways. There's Patreon. There's I now have this new thing on my channel where it's like... It's just, it's like a little button with a heart and it says thanks. And I think it's like just a little tip or something you can put on the channel. So anything is appreciated, honestly. Um, so yeah, that's my little plug for now. Um, I will end this live stream soon. Uh... Yeah, Glenn, I've seen that episode. Yeah, it, it was very staged. It was very, very staged. Um, Empire of Waterloo says, Hi, Alex. I like all the new ocean liner pics in the corner. So awesome to see all the interior pictures. Hope you do get to sail on Queen Mary 2 sometime soon. Thank you. Supernova3000 says, When you depart this cruel world, are you going to haunt the Queen Mary? You know what? You joke, but I will. I swear. First thing, first thing that's going to happen once I die, I'm going to haunt some of the people who have trolled me my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the people that hate my guts and I'm going to haunt them until they, they, they pee themselves. And then, and then I'm going to go over to the Queen Mary and I'm going to haunt that for the rest of my life. Um, my, rest of my afterlife, I should say. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice to haunt some cool places. Like, um, like, uh, yeah, the hand of God bumping the train. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would, so I would, ha yeah, I would haunt both Disneyland and, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, the Queen Mary. I would go back and forth. Honestly, I would take the bus. You know, I'd you know plop my little ghostly butt on a bus, take it all the way to to Long Beach, <clears throat> float over to the Queen Mary, 
and then uh, haunt that for a couple of days and switch back over to Disneyland. So that is my plan for the afterlife, folks. That is my plan. Uh, let's see. Rytopia says, the whole dress code policy puts me off traveling on the Queen Mary 2. I can see that. You know, I, I know some people really don't feel comfortable dressing up like that. Um, and it could be, it could also be tedious as well. Uh, I will admit, like, for my, you see, it knew I was going to shake the table. It knew it and it kept going. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so that is an issue that I, I told my friend. Because my friend... He says, look, if we're going to go on the Queen Mary 2, we have to do some of the formal nights in the main restaurant. You know, you'd like the whole, like, like, um, the, the, the thing, the, 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 the tuxedo. Yeah. And I thought, boy, that's going to be expensive to get myself a tuxedo. And I'm like, but he's right. Like, when will I ever get the chance to, to sail on the Queen Mary again? You know, like. I do, I've lived my life with the, the belief that you should, you should try to get out and do stuff because you never know when, you know, your time comes, so to speak. I've seen a lot of people who are very unhappy with their, I've seen a lot of people who are very unhappy with their lives. They're very busy. They're very, you know, and, and they, they, you know, they, they live their whole young life working really hard, um, never getting a chance to go places and try new things because they think, oh, I'll do it when I'm older. And then that time comes and they just, they just don't feel up to traveling. And I've lost a few friends in my life, uh, some people who have passed on. Um, and they had so many goals for places they were going to travel to and places that they were going to see and and each time I lost one of them I just thought to myself I'm like you know I because at the time I was very a very very busy person working all the time and I thought there's got to be more to life than just working for money I mean granted I do need money but I I want to live my life where I do stuff that uh that makes me happy. So I don't earn a lot of money right now. Like I said, if I want to rent the movie 1900, I have to pay $4 and I have to consider, can I afford to spend that four bucks? Because, you know, I live on my own and it's expensive. I don't earn very much money, but I'm happy. I'm happy doing what I do. And I think as little money as I have right now, I would much rather be doing this and being happy um, than doing what I was doing when I was younger and just feeling like I wasn't wasn't happy, you know? So, um, yeah, that's how I think of it. And some people have told me the same thing. They're like, hey, dude, you know, like I'm an older guy now and I can tell you if you don't travel now, you won't travel in the future. And I, I think that person might be right, you know? So, yeah. Obviously, people need to have responsibilities in their life. I have plenty of responsibilities in my life. I have plenty of things I have to take care of. But, uh, but I try my best to, to steer my life towards something that makes me feel fulfilled. As best I can, you know. No, nothing's perfect. My life is not perfect. Um, but we do what we can, you know. We do what we can. So, uh... Drew says, during World War II... When the Queen Mary was a troop ship, I heard rumors that the that Adolf Hitler put a bounty on her like he wanted the Queen Mary to sink. Yes, he did. He put a bounty of one million Reichsmarks. It was the, the currency of Germany at the time. The bounty was one million Reichsmarks and the Iron Cross with oak leaves. So um, the Iron Cross with oak leaves was like one of the highest badges of honor you could get. Um, and so he said... Any submarine captain, that that didn't only mean German submarines. It could have been Japanese or any other country that, you know, that was doing it for the bounty. He said, any submarine captain that sinks the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, uh, or both, will get rewarded 
with one, one million Reichsmarks and the Iron Cross with oak leaves. That was a lot of money back then. Um, today, that's still a lot of money. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they tried for six years. Uh, submarines hunted down the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth all over the world. Hunted them down. You know, they really wanted that bounty. Um, none of them could ever sink the Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth. That's, that's amazing. That's really, really amazing. Um, Eric says, how often did you experience paranormal activity at the Golden Horseshoe? Was it always in the upstairs storage room? Not always. Um, a lot of times, like, I have, like, videos about this, but a lot of times I, you know, you... <laughs> without getting too deep into it. Like, I mean, a lot of it was also on the stage, through the mirrors. I saw, a, me and my coworker both saw the same ghost with our own eyes before, standing in front of us in the seating area. Come on. Um, the track is dirty, so the every time the, the this little locomotive rolls over the uh, switch track, there's a piece of the switch track that isn't powered in order to prevent a short circuit. And so when it runs over that, um, it just doesn't pick up electricity on the other side very easily because the track's dirty. I have to clean the track again. That's what happens when you run them round and round and round and round. But anyway, so back to the ghosts. But yes, so Golden Horseshoe was, in my opinion, the most haunted place in Disneyland. I saw stuff there, usually something, something paranormal. Every night. Something. Anything. Every night. I could not say that about other places in the in the in the park. There were other places that I do consider haunted, but I didn't see stuff that often. It was like very rare. Um, and I, I've, I worked during my time at, at Disney. I also worked at Hilton as a, as an, en as a maintenance engineer. So I know how stuff works. And so usually I would try to debunk things that I thought were, you know, like if something weird happened in the golden horseshoe, I'd try to, um, I try to think about it from a technical perspective and go, okay, what could that have actually been? And uh, some, like, a few occasions I've been able to debunk things, but then other times I was just like, that is completely unexplainable. Um, and like I said, Golden Horseshoe is the only place I've ever been where I didn't feel safe at times. At times. Because other times I felt perfectly fine, but there were a few times where I did not feel safe. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... And it was funny because it, it's not like it was unknown. Like, pretty, at the time, everybody, every one of my coworkers knew Golden Horseshoe was haunted. Most of them had seen something. And a few of them, like, there was one lead who, who was like, I've been here for years. I never saw any ghosts. I looked at her. I said, I said, okay, but you can't look at me and tell me that after all the years you've been here, you've never seen something that you couldn't explain, you know, something that happened. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I've never seen any ghosts, but uh, there were a few things that I can't explain. And I said, thank you. You know, because that's that's exactly, you know, that's exactly what it is. There's some things there in that, that restaurant you can't explain. <laughs> so that was actually fun, though. Like, at the time, like, I wasn't, like, there were times where I was scared, but most of the time... I wasn't, it wasn't scary. There was just weird stuff happening and, and it was unexplainable at many times. It was unexplainable, but it was still fun. And I think honestly, a lot of my coworkers used to give me that shift. They'd say, Hey, I, you know, I got golden horseshoe. You got stage door cafe. Can we switch? And I'd be like, okay. Yeah. Because, because ultimately I preferred the golden horseshoe. It was a beautiful restaurant, um, beautiful interiors. Um, it's, you know, old West Victorian uh, architecture on the inside. Beautiful um, work done in 1955 by the Disney Company. Um, lots of artwork and things. Old artifacts, stuff like that. I used to love to tell the guests that were eating at the restaurant about the restaurant. Because if you look around, uh, there's the... the it's a two-story restaurant. So there's seats above. But right along the rim of the second floor balcony are 13 uh, longhorn, long, like bull longhorn horns.
longhorns. I don't know what the, I don't know what to call them. It's a type of it's a type of cattle called a longhorn, and they have then because they have long horns. But anyway, the point is that there's there was thirteen sets of them, and um, people, you know, they're, they've been there since 1955, but no one really talks about them. I knew what they were, so I told people I said, you know, like these. These were a collection by Walt Disney. This was Walt Disney's personal collection of longhorns. And he brought them here to Disneyland and put them up in the Golden Horseshoe. And they've been here all these years. And, you know, there was a... There's a painting on the back wall that was in the movie So Dear to My Heart. Um, there's glass panels towards the front of the restaurant that have glass, et glass etchings of cartoon characters that most people would not recognize. There's one with a man riding a donkey and the other one of a woman riding some kind of tuna fish. And, uh, and, and so people didn't know what those were. And I told them, I said, ah, well, that's, that's the Disney's cartoon character, Pecos Bill. And that's Slewfoot Sue, the original owner of the Golden Horseshoe restaurant. And so, um, yeah, so that was, you know, it's a nod to the old uh, Golden Horseshoe review that happened in that restaurant. So I used to love working there ultimately um, because it was so interesting and it, there was so much history in that restaurant. So, um, yeah, it was nice. Thank you, Drew. Yeah, right, Tupi, if you're right. You know, when people die, it really makes you realize that you don't have time to waste. I That's what I felt like, you know. Some of my friends, they, they've noticed that, I'm a, that I, I get a bit uh, impatient with waiting for things. And they, they go like, what? you know, why are you like that? And I go, you know what? I never used to be like that. I used to be so patient for everything. I said, but... After living my life and seeing the things I've seen, I, I don't want to wait anymore. I want to see as much of life as I can while I can, you know? That's how I live my life. I live my life uh, as if I might be gone soon. So I want to try everything as, mu as much as I can. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Conrad says, I think it took no bounty at all to get Hitler. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Chris Butler says, as a tour guide, I met surviving members of a U-boat crew who had stalked Queen Mary. They didn't want to sink her and were glad they did not get the chance. Oh, wow. That's really cool. That's so cool. I love when people share stories like that with me. That's so neat. I love learning about perspectives of, of, you know, things that happened in history. Little Gamer says, how often do you get super chats? Eh, not that often. Uh, I think maybe once every two or three live streams, I'll get some super chats. Um, oh, Conrad says, if you wanted to, could you place the trains on backwards and run them in the reverse direction, mostly counterclockwise? I could. Um, but if I, if I do that, um, let's see. No, I could. That's not a problem. Yeah, I could. Um, I don't know why, but I prefer clockwise. I don't know why. But yeah, I could technically turn them all around and run them in reverse. It's not a problem at all. Uh, maybe one day I'll kind of surprise you all and switch it up and put them all in reverse. Well, reverse direction, I should say. Jeez. But that's a strong little engine. I mean, you've seen it. It's pulling a, a six-car train. Like, that's a strong little engine. I love that little engine. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. Misty's right. Olympic was hit by a torpedo. There's a dent, but I don't think it blew up, though. <laughs> Drew says, how long did you work for Disney, and do you think Disney want to hire you back like you don't have to? Um, I worked for Disney for six years. Do I think Disney would want to hire me back? 
I mean, they don't even know who I am. That's the sad part. I spent six years of my life dedicating my life to that company because I wanted to be part of Walt Disney's legacy. And the friggin' people I worked with didn't even know my name. Like, I was just a number to them, honestly. I'm not even kidding. Some people knew me by my ID number more than my name. It was just sad. It was such a sad place to work as an employee. Um, one of, it's In fact, in terms of how I was treated as an employee, it was the worst place I've ever worked at. Now, in terms of experience, it wasn't the worst place I ever worked at. I had a lot of fun doing some of the jobs I did. And I met some celebrities when I was a tour guide. You know, that's kind of cool. You can't replace those memories. Um, and then, you know, I met some really nice people, you know, some really great Disney fans and families and people from all over the world, people with all kinds of backgrounds and stories, um, you know, like people who've, people from India who saved up their whole life to take their kids to the original Disneyland because the parents remember watching Walt Disney on television when they were kids and they saved up their whole lives to visit his park. Just so they could experience that again like and they would share those stories with me and it was that's disney magic not this cheap stuff they sell today at their parks the real disney magic is the legacy the 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 good feelings that walt left people before he died and so i felt so lucky to meet those kinds of people but unfortunately, the Disney company today, the way they think is, gee, so you like feeling good. Okay, well, then we're going to offer you less money because now we know you want to be here. So, yeah, it's it, in terms of being an employee, that was one of the worst companies I ever worked for, hands down. But, yeah, uh, as to whether they'd want to hire me again, they don't even know me. All my years there, all the work I did, no one even knows my name. So that that was proven to me when a couple of years back I made a video about uh, about uh, the about the Disneyland um, tour guides. So it was a history of the tour department, the department I was in for two years. I made that video, and all these guest relations tour guides started like, especially former ones, were leaving messages. Uh, in the comment section saying, oh, pff, you're a liar. I don't remember you there and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And all this, people I met, people I knew, people I used to have wonderful conversations with, people who I remember fondly were typing up, oh, I don't remember you. You're just a liar. You're lying about being in this department because you want fame or whatever. I'm like, it was, I was just a tour guy. That's not famous, you know, like, but it showed me that, I, you know, while I thought I had a great time with these people, these people don't even know who I am. And that hurt. That hurt really bad. And I have, thankfully, there is a person that watches my channel who worked with me in those years as a tour guide. You know, his name is Manny. And he worked with me when I worked at Riverbell and Golden Horseshoe. And when I went to Guest Relations, I think he went soon after. Um, and we worked together in Guest Relations. And Manny was like, yeah, those guys are mean. You know, they're like, they don't even remember me either. And I'm like, that's just so sad, you know? Like, you could you could dedicate yourself to something and then people don't care, you know? Heck, that happens now. I dedicate myself to the Queen Mary. I'm trying everything I can that I know how to do to help the ship. And then there's people that are telling me to just quit. I'm like, wow, you know? But let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um... Thomas Brooks says, was the Golden Horseshoe the restaurant where you cleaned the brass decorations? Yes. So there were brass wall sconces. They're, they're lights that are mounted to the wall. They have this beautiful brass, like, curly Q kind of, like, design. And when I worked there, they all looked black. And I was like, that's weird. Like, this restaurant has all this wonderful brass work. The railings and stuff are all brass. Beautiful stuff. I, I said, you know, like... Why would why would this metal be black? Like that doesn't make any sense. And I thought that's got to be real brass. So one day we had like brass polish because we use that to polish the park's handrails and things that have brass. 
So I had brass polish and I kind of just went up there and I kind of went, you know, just kind of cleaning a little spot and it shined up to a bright, beautiful brass color. And I looked up some old photos because back then I was obsessed with Disneyland's history. I looked up some old photos of Golden Horseshoe and indeed all those light fixtures were bright brass color in the past. So what I did was one day, like it was during the off season back when Disneyland still had off seasons and the park was relatively empty. There was almost nobody in the restaurant most of the day. So I knew I was gonna be bored that day. There you know, wouldn't have been much to do. So to keep myself busy, I shined all the brass wall sconces and all the brass light fixtures around the entire restaurant. Shined them all brand new brass color. And um, the place glittered and glistened. It was beautiful. Um, and I, I maintained that that gloss as long as I worked there. I was I was there for almost three years, about two and a half, three years about. And, um, and I maintained that brass color that whole time. And... Um, and when I left, I obviously I couldn't maintain the brass color. Now today, it's all back to black. So all white fixtures are black again. But I tell you, take a little bit of brass shiner to those. It'll shine up to bright brass. Bright, bright brass. Come on, move. Um, Dangerous Brian says, aren't there rumors that Walt Disney haunts Disneyland? Obviously, I think that has been debunked. I also expect you have visited Walt Disney's flat above the fire station. Yes, in fact, I at times, there I was part of the shift that held the keys for Walt Disney's private apartment because uh, because people, there would be expectations that if there was a VIP and the VIP wanted to see Walt Disney's apartment, we would need someone who had the keys to immediately meet with them and open the, the apartment up for them. So some people were chosen to hold the keys. And there was one, there was a few days uh, where I was chosen to hold the keys because I was at City Hall that day. So I would have that. So I've been up to the apartment several times, been up to, you know, to a lot of the VIP places around the park because that's what I did. I was a VIP host. So um, I did a lot of stuff. I met a lot of like, well, I would say a lot, but yeah, but, yeah less than 10 celebrities. Um, a few of them, I didn't even know them when I talked to them. Like Jerry Bruckheimer, the director who filmed all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. I, he walked up to me and he's like, I'm here to see World of Color. I'm like, okay. I'm looking at my list. I'm like, I don't see you. Who, what was your name? And he's like, Bruckheimer. I'm like, okay, Bruckheimer. And I'm like, first name? He's like, Jerry. And I'm like, Jerry Bruckheimer. Okay. Oh, here you are, you know. And I did not recognize him. And then afterwards, I was telling my coworker, I was like, this guy thinks he's famous. He's like, oh, I'm Jerry Bruckheimer. My friend's like, that is, yeah, that he is famous. He's a famous director. I was like, oh. <laughs> so there were a few people I met that I didn't even realize they were famous till afterwards. But um, yeah, that was, so there are, there, those are memories I wouldn't trade for anything. I may not have enjoyed my employment, but my times working there was was sometimes really great. Um, but as for rumors of Walt Disney haunting Disneyland, I don't believe it. I also believe that there might be... I don't know, I wouldn't use the word heaven because I don't necessarily stick to the beliefs of Christianity. Some of my beliefs are even Buddhist in nature, actually. I do believe there might be a positive place where people's spirits can go. Um, and so therefore, Walt Disney, from all the research I've done over the years, was a very good man. I think that he, his spirit would actually be with his family, his wife and his daughters that he loved dearly. He loved them so much. I think that he would be with them in some better place, whatever is up there, if it's up there, um, I think he'd be with them rather than being trapped in a theme park. You know, um, he loved Disneyland, but I don't think he would be permanently in Disneyland. And uh, so there was one time where <clears throat> there was things that he did that repeated so, I mean, you have to watch my videos on it, but, um, but basically sometimes I would have an early shift and I would be the opener for Golden Horseshoe. 
So I'd go into Golden Horseshoe, I'd get everything set up, put all the chairs and tables where they need to be, um, you know, set up the condiment counter and everything. And so I'd have to be there pretty early sometimes. And um, if I was there around 7.45 in the morning, the whole place would smell like cigar smoke, which is weird because there's no smoking allowed in the restaurant. All the cast members know this. And there's no cast. there was no cast members there because the cashiers are in a different room putting money into their registers and stuff and getting ready to, to work. So, But the place would smell like cigar smoke um, at 7.45 in the morning. It's like on the dot, it would suddenly fill with cigar smoke. And it's, it was this beautiful aroma. Um, and then come 8 o'clock, the smell was gone. Just gone. Gone. And uh, I later learned through my research that uh, whenever Walt Disney was in the park, usually weekends, uh, he would wake up from his firehouse apartment on Main Street, and then around 7.45, he would come over to the Golden Horseshoe to smoke a cigar before the park opened at 8 a.m. Once the park opened at 8 a.m., he quit his cigar, he went out to the Rivers of America, sat down on a bench, and waited for all the people to fill the park, and he would watch their happy faces as they all filled the park. So um, that's what he did. That was his routine on the weekends. So um, yeah, it, it's so yeah that. But do I believe that's his ghost? No, I feel like that is one of those things that the paranormal enthusiasts call like a like a recording of something. Like it's just a, a like a replay of a recording of a time. And so I feel like maybe he he did that so many times it just replays like a rerun. But I don't think it's really him, you know. Uh, Dyslexic Batman says, you should make a whole one-off video talking about your experience if you haven't already. I have. Yeah, I have it. So um, it's three videos. It's called it's called um, <clears throat> Haunted Disneyland. It's, it's on my channel. And every Halloween season, I put them front and center on the um, channel. So when people want to come to the channel to see Halloween-themed stuff, it'll be up there. Um, but yeah, it's on my channel. It's called Haunted Disneyland. There's three videos on it, so. Um, uh, Queen Mary still? Yeah, I wish Queen Mary still had the second class pool as well. Red 2 pip says, you should frequently reverse direction. It helps reduce wear on one side of the track and engine. Yeah, you're right. I probably should do that. Um... Drew says, are the songs that are playing in the background, are they from the 1930s? Yes, they are. Well, no, some of them are from the 1940s, actually. So it's 1930s and 1940s. Uh, uh, let's see. All right. Emma says, Jungle Cruise movie 2021. Have you seen it? Nope. I do not plan to see that movie. <laughs> Supernova says, did you destroy the historic value when you cleaned up the patina of the light fixtures? Maybe. <laughs> but now it'll build a whole new future, won't it? Um... Yeah, residual haunting, but well, no, I, I mean maybe, but I just want to make it clear. I don't think it's a it's a haunting of a person in that sense when it comes to the cigar smoke. I think it's just a re-recording of history, but it's hard for me to explain because frankly, there's no real science behind it, so I can't like explain it in a way that makes sense. But that's the way I think of it in my head. But anyway, folks, we have reached the end of our live stream. It's been well over two hours. Um, but I thought this was really fun. It was really nice to kind of talk to you guys. I know I did a live stream earlier today at the park, but it was it was nice to be able to come here, have some tea, and relax, and kind of talk to you all. So um, it's getting late. The track needs to be cleaned. Um, and I'm getting sleepy. So and anyway, folks, thank you so much for watching. Um, this... I don't think there will be a video on Tuesday. If there is, it will probably be a live stream or a pre-recorded something. 
that's the reason why is because I want to try to focus on getting a, a history video out for Friday. Um, but there will be a, a tea time on Wednesday, so expect a tea time on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Um, and then hopefully Saturday we'll, we'll have the rescheduled um, Queen Mary's Lost Places. So that will be about the lounges on the ship. Some of the lounges are not even there anymore. So that'll be really cool. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.